And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. Southern Germany, 1624. Hunger. It greeted the man at dawn, and lay down with him at dusk. Sometimes its gnawing woke him up at night. Even before the war, cold weather had made bad harvests. Then the emperor came, took land, and debased the coin to pay his mercenaries. The bread price quadrupled, and that was all before soldiers sacked his house and carried off the family cow. Now there was only hunger, hunger and the dead, and a terrible solution. Thanks so much to Ting Mobile for helping this historic tale come through loud and clear. Periodic famine was a regular occurrence in 17th century Europe. Natural events like extreme weather, insect infestation, or botanical disease could cost a harvest. But while going hungry wasn't unheard of, like many things about the Thirty Years' War, it was the scale of the famine that ensures it's still remembered to this day. And as we continue our investigation of the Thirty Years' War as a humanitarian disaster, we have to examine the role hunger played. Even without the war, the 17th century was a lean one for Central Europe, sitting at the center of the Little Ice Age, a time where, for uncertain reasons, temperatures dropped several degrees in the Northern Hemisphere. Now, theories about why include the Earth's orbit and tilt, increased volcanic eruptions, or changes in oceanic circulation. But no matter what the cause, the end result was that European farms likely saw decreased crop productivity and shortened growing seasons, so there was just less food to go around, period. And then came the Kipper and Vipper years, one of the most unbelievable economic crises in the history of Europe. Now, I know that's an odd term, but there's really no current-day English equivalent. What exactly Kipper and Vipper stands for varies on the telling. But one leading theory states that kipper refers to clipping coins, more on that in a minute, and vipper means a sort of seesaw, a reference to the scales of the money changers. The Holy Roman Empire, you see, didn't have a single currency. Southern Germany had silver and gold coins they favored, and Northern Germany used two different coins, which we're not going to differentiate here to make things simpler. Both, however, theoretically, did have pennies. But in reality, they cost so much to produce that the state gave up, and people mostly imported foreign coins instead. Which was normal, since Germany was a trade crossroads. And this was a period where certain trading towns might have dozens of foreign currencies in circulation due to traders passing through. Now, no one knows where they came from. Suspects include Switzerland and Italy. But in the late 1500s, some debased foreign coins had made their way into the Holy Roman Empire. Now, taking a step back for a moment, what does it mean for a coin to be debased, you might ask? Well, simply put, it means that the gold and silver coin contained less of the precious metal than they were supposed to. And because people in the empire kept trading their non-debased gold and silver coins for debased ones, the states as a whole were losing money. So then rulers began debasing their own coins to try to even everything out, but the end result being that by 1609, the value of the empire's silver coins fell by 20%. Of course, there are a few different ways to debase coinage. One involves mixing other metals into them, bringing down the silver and gold content of each coin so you can make more coins with less precious metal. But another one is clipping coins, shaving or cutting edges off of them and then melting down those scraps to make brand new coins. And in an economic system that relies on a coin literally being worth its weight in silver and gold, both those tactics are dangerous. They literally make money worth less than advertised. Now, even back then, it was known that bad currency drives out good, making people hoard non-debased coinage or for governments to debase their own coin in competition. But in the short term, debasing could have its benefits. You have 8,000 coins, then you debase them, and now you have 10,000 coins. You just upped your assets 20%, which is useful if you need to hire or pay, oh, I don't know, let's take a shot in the dark here, a bunch of soldiers. You see where this is going. Even before the war began, a lot of city mints, with minimal imperial oversight, were already debasing their coins. Ferdinand pursued that policy for Bohemia even before the revolt, and afterward, the Catholic nobles he brought in to replace the exiled Protestant ones kicked it into high gear. 
But debasing became especially attractive once the war began, and states came under strain funding their defense. But it was also both a way to enrich those doing it and practice economic sabotage. Nobles, town leaders, and even priests would start their own unofficial mints, clipping good coins or producing bad ones. Then those with the highest gold and silver content they would keep. And the rest? Well, they'd get a traveling con man to bring them to the next state over, preferably one that supported the opposite cause, and convince common people to exchange their good coins for the debased ones. It essentially became a race to the bottom, with each state trying to dump bad coin on their neighbors, take the neighbors' non-debased coins back, and debase them to make more money. And the result was a total collapse of the currency. Some coins fell to an eighth of their value, and hyperinflation went out of control. Bread prices were particularly dire. In one diary from the period, a soldier claims that 45 silver pieces could only buy two pounds of bread. And a seminary student in a university town remembered a loaf costing a full gold piece. And some of the biggest perpetrators of this were major figures in the war. Ferdinand, as we mentioned, championed debasing Bohemian coin to pay his soldiers. But when he moved his Catholic lords into Bohemia, nearly all of them set up mints to make a quick buck. The most successful of which was Albrecht von Wallenstein, who invested money he'd inherited from his wife into mints in Bohemia, using the profits to set up a mini fiefdom in the country and raise a private army. Then using this very literal war chest, he became one of the most influential imperial generals of the conflict. Though imperial edict finally fixed the exchange rate in 1623, there was no undoing the damage. Urbanized classes like merchants and tradesmen were ruined, with food prices rising eightfold. And because they lived in cities, they had no farms to grow their own food. Areas like Bohemia were hit even worse, since Ferdinand's religious policies were driving out the moneyed classes of Protestant artisans and skilled workers. It left the country short of doctors, lawyers, merchants, and builders. They in turn fled to Protestant cities, driving prices even higher there, since more population means more demand for food. And then came the soldiers. Soldiers that had to be paid, often by rulers ordering tax hikes on their already destitute subjects. Generals routinely took on more soldiers than they could pay, making up for the shortfall with contributions from the cities they marched into, essentially demanding money in exchange for not sacking the town. Armies also quartered soldiers in civilian homes, at times for months, with families made to provide for the unwelcomed house guests. And of course, there was also the looting, pillaging, and confiscation of crops and livestock, which was pretty rampant. But that was micro-scale. On a macro level, once the monarchs began running out of money, they started paying troops in land. Ferdinand was the first to do this, granting Maximilian lands in the Palatinate for the use of his army. But there were others. And new rulers, unfamiliar with the territory, did little to even out the situation. Accounts of the time discuss nuns corralling orphans into convent grounds, begging passing troops for food, families trying to eat grass, and cats and dogs disappearing from cities. Soldiers, often just as hungry, lamed or poisoned their horses so they could be butchered for food. And because sieges were such a feature of the conflict, garrisons found themselves running low on supplies much earlier than normal. It was mostly from here that the stories of cannibalism came. And while we shouldn't believe every one of them, it's generally accepted that it happened on occasion. The poor eating each other, and the rich making more money. But that was not the end. There was still one final horseman left. Because while armies marched from town to town, taking whatever they wished, they often left something in their wake. Plague, pestilence, and death. The rider on the pale horse is coming, and his scythe will kill more than the other horsemen combined. And, you know, actually, while we're on the topic of devastation, I gotta ask, how is your phone bill looking these days? Ooh, that bad, huh? Well, luckily we're back with another money-saving deal from the new and improved Ting Mobile. They've got a plan that can work on anybody's budget. For instance, if you just need unlimited talk and text, they've got you covered for only 10 bucks a month. Or, depending on your data needs, Ting has plans starting at 15 bucks, all the way to the mighty unlimited talk, text, and data for just 45. Meaning there's a perfect plan for you and your family. Oh, and speaking of families, oh, Jeff, yeah, how much have you saved in the last three months on your family's two phones and an iPad? Over $230. Wait a minute, that means you're on track to save, like, more than 900 bucks this year. Looks like someone's getting a new PlayStation and an Xbox. 
What's really neat, though, is the only thing that actually changes is you getting a lower monthly phone bill. You still get robust nationwide LTE and 5G coverage, not to mention access to Ting's award-winning customer service, plus, and this is my favorite, no contracts ever. Not to mention, switching has never been easier. Just head to extracredits.ting.com to check your phone's compatibility, create an account, and pick the plan that's right for you. Oh, and if you bring your phone, you'll also get a $25 service credit to try Ting with no strings attached. And because using our link, again, that's extracredits.ting.com, helps support the shows you love while lowering your phone bill at the same time, there's really never been a better time to try Ting. That's right, Zoe. Ahmed Zia Turk, Alicia Bramble, Casey Mustia, Dominic Valenciana, Joseph Blame, Kyle Murgatroyd, and O'Reels One are fantastic legendary patrons.